So a few weeks ago, I was catching up with a friend over dinner and we we're having a conversation about the negative effects of social media on people because she asked me whether or not I felt I was contributing to the problem because of my current job, publishing short films on YouTube and making a living from it. We looked up some research and found that 91% of 14 year olds now own a phone. And with the average screen time being seven hours a day, internet addiction is now linked to structural and functional changes in the brain associated with emotional processing, executive attention, and decision-making. So she looked at me again and said, do you feel like you're contributing to the problem? And I said, well, to be completely honest, no. Because I think in creating art on social media and publishing that art can be part of the solution to offsetting this epidemic. She looked at me and said, art on YouTube? How? So I told her about this new movement on social media called the YouTube New Wave. It's a reaction to the clickbait content that propagates most of our feeds today by pushing for more meaningful content that tells stories instead of begging for attention. She said, okay, good luck with that. But I was confident about my thesis. So I used the only analogy that came to mind and asked her, when was the last time she had a nice meal for a special occasion? Perhaps at a fancy restaurant or some well-prepared and intentional meal. And if after that meal she went back home and still felt really hungry and wanted to eat a lot of snacks, she paused and said no and said, I felt satisfied after the meal. I said, exactly. It's the same thing with our brains. Whenever I watch a good artistic or indie movie, I never feel compelled to go on social media to doom scroll because I feel satisfied and I want to properly digest what I just consumed. She agreed and said, yeah, she recently had changed her diet had been intentionally cooking all of her meals and felt like a new version of herself. And got me thinking about this food analogy. We consume both media and food, yet one seems to be talked about a lot more than the other. I grew up learning about food pyramids, plate charts, recommended portions and ratios and different diets, but never had I heard about a social media pyramid, a social media consumption ratio, or a social media diet aside from just a detox. As a matter of fact, I think the only solution I've ever been presented with is to not go on my phone. But imagine you went to the doctor and you're like, ah, oh, my stomach hurts, I have a stomach ache, and they told you to not eat food as a solution to feeling better. I really don't think consumption is the problem, I think it's what we're consuming. I think we need to acknowledge that our phones are here to stay, but it's our relationships with them that need to change. Over Thanksgiving, I was with my grandmother, and uh, after dinner, she asked me to help her with her phone because she had been logged out of Facebook and needed help getting back in. When we logged back in, the first post that popped up was a post that 6,000 civilians had been killed because of the war in Ukraine. I scrolled down a little bit and saw a cute cat video. You know, if we all pause for a second, I'm sure we can think to a moment in our lives where we read a shocking headline sometime in the past year or let alone the past month, week, day, or even hour. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think you would have had a larger reaction to that maybe five years ago, 10 years ago, 20, or even 50? I think we can all agree that because of the internet, we're becoming largely desensitized to the world around us. Increasingly, I feel like I care less and less about the issues people around the world are facing. But I'm not a bad person, right? People now consume 90 times the amount of information they did when compared to the 1940s, so it's no wonder we often feel overstimulated and consequently desensitized. And if we stay in the past for a moment and take a peek back into our history, there are times there have been movements that reflect you know, humanity and society's view about the world. Modernism, for example, is a 19th century literary and artistic movement that captured the idealism of a newly industrialized world. And the Eiffel Tower is a fantastic example of this. Postmodernism, on the other hand, reflected the lost state of humanity after the Second World War. We see this in existentialist literature, or even the irony of Andy Warhol's soup can. But where are we now? Well, our society is described as being in a meta-modernistic state which is essentially an extreme oscillation between optimism and nihilism about the world around us, but at a very rapid pace. 
An example would be one moment feeling like you can help save the environment by doing your part, driving an electric car, recycling, or saving water. But the next, you read a headline that large companies are doing more environmental damage than anything your individual actions might ever offset. You end up feeling like the world is doomed and that nothing you ever do will actually have an impact. With the internet, we've been exposed to this emotional whiplash at a much faster pace than ever before in history. Studies now show that people can display symptoms similar to PTSD just by consuming violent news alone. And psychologists now believe that we're becoming emotionally desensitized as a defense mechanism against our hyperconsumption of media. So I thought back to the conversation I was having with my friend. How does this tie back into art? And how could I put art forward and push it as a solution in the wake of all of this noise? Well, what do you think of when you think of art? Do you think of the Mona Lisa? Do you think of an old Greek statue or perhaps the long line into a museum? But what I'm guessing didn't pop into your mind was a video on your phone of someone playing guitar, a person singing, or perhaps an avant-garde film on YouTube. Throughout history, art has been a vehicle to share stories and emotions that transcend time. Art brings us together and helps us better understand the human experience. We quite literally have the ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes through a process called embodied cognition, which then leads to cognitive empathy. Social media gives us the ability to share stories and art that bring us together in a way that we've never been able to before in history. It's proven to increase levels of oxytocin, which spark empathy and connection, but it also reduces bias and helps bring us together and helps us see and understand different perspectives and ways of life. I don't think social media is the problem. I think what we're consuming on social media is the problem. But as I was thinking about this, it kind of clicked to me in the moment. And I thought back to my childhood and everything I'd been told about the importance of eating veggies. And I was like, huh. Could the consumption of online art be the metaphorical veggies for the mind? I grew up being told about the importance of eating healthy, and in my schools I saw posters of food pyramids with recommended portions and ratios, and we were drilled that breakfast was the most important meal of the day, and that having a colorful plate was a necessity if we wanted to grow up to be strong and healthy. But still, I'd never heard of the same guidelines, let alone the same specificity regarding our consumption of media. What was the equivalent of social media vegetarianism, of social media veganism? Would it be no social media? Would it be no online news? Would it be a limited number of hours per day? You know, growing up as one of the first generations with a smartphone, there's virtually no guidance on navigating the complex Wild West that is the internet. And it's kind of shocking considering that there is this lack of infrastructure that's commonly discussed, considering this is one of the largest issues we face. So I thought back to my friend and the conversation that we were having and how art plays a role in all of this. And I thought back to this kind of emotional desensitization that we are facing in these moments and this kind of emotional whiplash that we've been faced with. And, you know, within the food industry, there are regulations to protect us from all of this, right? We have information labels so that we know what we're consuming, and then we have calorie amounts so that we know how much we're consuming. But the whole industry, again, is based around this 2,000 calorie diet that's a recommendation. It's not a one-size-fits-all solution, but it's at least a helpful reference. You know, we've been reinforced in our schools and by our teachers the importance of eating healthy. But we lack this guidance and reinforcement when it comes to our consumption of media. My question is, where are the guidelines to protect us from this cognitive manipulation? What is the equivalent of a food label? Why don't I know what I'm consuming and how much of it? Should I be watching YouTube? And what type of videos should I be watching on YouTube? Given this lack of ration and guidelines and recommendations and all of that, how could anyone, let alone a kid, make good decisions about what they're consuming and its impact on their health? Well, I believe art can provide us with the answer. 
and art in its broadest sense. I believe art is content that adds meaning to our lives. It's more available and accessible than ever. My grandma, for example, loves comedy and likes to take walks and listens to comedians on her phone. My mom, on the, uh, on the other hand, is a teacher and likes to watch videos about French history. And me, I love to watch first-person documentaries from people all around the world. We all find our own pockets of the internet to add something more to our lives. But what we're adding doesn't have to bring us down. I believe that these pockets on the internet that we find are art, and they can bring us together. And, but more importantly, they spark our oxytocin as well, which sparks empathy and connection, but it also releases our blood pressure levels and rates of anxiety and depression. So I believe that the more we can consciously fill our e-diets with art, the better our mental health will be, the more connected we'll all become, but most importantly, the more human we'll all feel. By the end of the night, my friend and I had found some sort of common ground and thankfully she didn't think I was a part of the problem and instead agreed that art could be a part of the solution. I'm optimistic that we will see more guidelines and regulations and protections over time. I really am. But at the end of the day, just like with food, we're the ones pushing the metaphorical shopping cart in the grocery store each and every time we pick up our phones. Let's choose art. Thank you.